come this morning to chapter 15. Uh, may God bless the, uh, the, the, the reading of his word and the study of his word this morning as he speaks to us. He has something to say to us this day. And this morning we're going to look at Acts chapter 15. And uh, as you look at your handout, here's the key verse for you. It's from Acts 15, 11. This is what Peter says. He says, We believe that we are saved by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they are. And he's speaking of uh, the Gentiles. Because this is a chapter, as we're going to see in just a minute, chapter 15 is a chapter of conflict. Um, a more than one type of conflict. We're going to look at that this morning. Where does the action take place? If you look at your handout again, Antioch and Jerusalem, these two churches that are the premier churches of the book of Acts. Um, you're going to meet some new people this morning. You're going to meet James, the half-brother of Jesus. We heard about him before uh, in chapter 12 when Peter is miraculously released from prison and then he says, tell James, whatever, and then he goes off to another place. So what that tells us even is that fairly early, James, who was the half-brother of Jesus, who did not even believe that Jesus was the Son of God until after his death and resurrection, James at this point has become one of the leaders of the Church of Jerusalem, in addition to the Apostles. Who is this James? How many of you have read the book of James in the New Testament? Okay. Um, the writer of the, the earthly writer of the book of James is this same James, James the half-brother of Jesus. You're also going to meet two more, Judas and Silas, this morning. And they are leaders. You can look at your notes. They're well-respected. They're leading men from believers in Jerusalem. And they're also prophets as well. And later on, we'll never hear about Judas again after this chapter, but Silas, you're going to hear about from now on because from, the, from chapter 16 on, Barnabas and Paul are no longer working companions. Instead, Paul and Silas are companions. And so we're going to be introduced to Silas here, and then we're going to get to know him a lot better. And then you can look at some other, uh, some other things here. And then if you want to, you can just flip over to the, last pe to the back side of your handout, because that will take us as we go through the message, um, as we go through the message this morning. So here we come to chapter 15, and everything has been going very, very well. A lot of things have been happening. Chapter 14 ended with Paul and Barnabas coming back to the church and saying, here are the wonderful things that God has done. And God truly did wonderful things. God opened the door of salvation to the Gentiles. And you and I are sitting here this morning because God did that. Um, I, don't, I don't know if there are any uh, people of uh, anyone here this morning of Jewish descent. I doubt it. Okay? We're all here this morning because God opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. We're all here this morning ultimately because Paul and Barnabas went on a missionary journey and preached the gospel to Gentiles. That's why we're here. And guess what? One day we're going to get to heaven and you're going to find out your whole spiritual DNA. Won't that be fun? Won't that be exciting? You'll find out, oh, there was this one. Now some of you can say, oh, I'm, I'm a Christian because my friend led me to the Lord. I'm a Christian because I had a godly mother or grandfather or, or that. But what about beyond that generation? Most of us have no idea. Most of us, but we'll find out in heaven. But I can go ahead and tell you right now, Paul and Barnabas are in your spiritual DNA. How about that? And probably Paul and Silas as well. So here we go, and we come to chapter 15, and we have two disagreements. We're only going to get to the first one this morning. The first one involves the whole church. The second one involves Paul and Barnabas. And I don't know about you, but I come to chapter 15, and my question is, and maybe yours is, Holy Spirit, why did you put this in here? It's about conflict. God is doing so many good things at the same time. Why put a spotlight on something negative? Why not keep a spotlight on the great things that God is doing? Why do we, what does this mean for me? And, and it seems like kind of a Jewish thing anyhow, and I'm not Jewish. It's about circumcision and the law of Moses, and it has nothing to do with me. May I say to you that when you come to parts of the Bible that you don't understand, 
and you think this is not relevant to me, this has no meaning for me, why is this here? It's good for us to go to the author, the Holy Spirit, and ask him, why did you put this in and what does this mean to me? He knows. He's, he's done it for a reason. So that's what we're going to do today, and I think we're going to have some answers today. So here we go as we look at this. So the first conflict is verses 1 through 35. The second conflict is only about six verses long, and it's the end of the chapter. So what is this big disagreement that turns our attention from the wonderful work of God, and how does it show up? Okay, so the Gentile and the Jewish believers are in Antioch. They are living harmoniously. They are living happily together. There's no conflict. Paul and Barnabas and others are teaching the Word of God to them. And in the midst of all of this, something happens. Some people show up. Okay, do you have to click something for me and then I can get it? I've got it on. I've got it. Okay. Uh, can you take that one off, please? Okay. Cannot put it back up. There we go. And we'll see how we do. So, some men came from Judea to Antioch and they started teaching the believers, you cannot be saved unless you're circumcised as the law of Moses requires. Paul and Barnabas got into a fierce argument with them about this, so forth and so on. And so here we have this. Here's how the argument starts. I want you to notice something. When Paul and Barnabas are teaching, it will say, Paul and Barnabas taught the Word of God. When we come to the end of this conflict, I'm, I'm looking at the time and I want to make sure we get it all in, it will say, Paul and Barnabas taught the Word of God. When Paul and Barnabas go from city to city, you know what it says? And they preached the Word of God and they proclaimed the Word of God. Look at what this says instead. They started teaching the believers. We get into trouble when we don't teach the Word of God. We get into trouble when we don't teach the Word of God. And what it says here is that they just came and they started teaching them. What are they teaching them? They're teaching them something about a Jewish tradition. When Paul and Barnabas hear this, they immediately begin to argue with them. Uh, I've used a particular translation. If you look at your Bibles, if you've got your Bible with you, it may say a sharp and fierce debate. It may say a sharp and heated uh, discussion, but it was an argument. It was a fight. It was a fight. And as Paul and Barnabas begin to argue with them, they begin to argue this is absolutely in direct opposition to what Paul and Barnabas have just done, right? Paul and Barnabas have just gone throughout Asia and they've been saying Jesus Christ saves, Gentiles have become Christian, they've come into the church and that's all that Paul and Barnabas have taught them. They haven't taught them something else. But along come some people, and I want you to notice something this morning and think about this, depending on where the Lord leads you, depending on where your church home is, depending on where you go in the future and who you let fit come into your life and speak into your life. Who are the spiritual parents of this group of people? It's Paul and Barnabas primarily, right? And some of the others. It's people there that are giving their lives for the gospel. It's people there who are investing their lives and investing their time in the spiritual well-being of this, of this church in Antioch. But then along come some people. The people haven't led them to the Lord. The people haven't sacrificed for them. The people have done nothing for them, but they want to tell them how to live their Christian lives. They want to tell them, now this is what you should do, and this is what you shouldn't do. Listen, generally, as a child of God and as a Christian, trust those who have led you to the Lord, who have sacrificed to help you as a Christian who have been there for you in the beginning, in the times, and be a lot slower about people who come along who have no investment in your spiritual life. No investment whatsoever. Now, does God bring um, uh, evangelists and speakers all along that can help you? Yes, He can. And yes, He does. But brothers and sisters, as Paul later says, he says to them as he writes to them, he says, you have many teachers and whatever, but you only have 
one Father. Honor those in your Christian life who have sacrificed to help you grow in God and to become a Christian. These people come in, these men come in without any investment but want to tell them what to do. The argument is so fierce that they decide that they have to... There we go. Okay. They got into a fierce argument. Now those of us that know our Bibles know what the Bible says about leaders. Do you know what it says about leaders in the Bible? It says that leaders should be gentle and should not strive. In other words, leaders shouldn't argue, okay? But here we have a really serious thing. Paul and Barnabas are arguing. It's serious. And it's serious enough that they decide, we got to go to Jerusalem, the head church, the mother church. We've got to find out who's wrong, who's right. Because Paul and Barnabas aren't going to back down, and these men are not going to back down either. Now, as we think about this, remember I said, why is this here? This just seems kind of Jewish to, to me. Does it have any significance for us? It has a huge significance for us, as we're going to see this morning. And so they, they go off on their way. It's important enough, it's a 300-mile journey on foot from Antioch to Jerusalem. But it's serious enough that they're going to take the trip. So as they go, they went through Phoenicia and Samaria. Where's Phoenicia today? How many of you know your Middle East geography? Anybody? I'll get, you say no, I don't. Phoenicia is present-day Lebanon, okay? So, ah, ah, there you go, okay? So present-day Lebanon. So there are churches in Syria, in Phoenicia, sorry, in Phoenicia and Samaria, and when Paul and Barnabas say, this is what God has done, Gentiles have turned to God, there was great joy in all, to all the believers. It brought great joy. So I want you to see something. Here, these men, when they hear about Gentile believers, they say, you've got to be circumcised, you've got to follow the law of Moses. And they, they want them to do something more. When these people, these people have come from Jerusalem. These people, these Christians from Phoenicia and Samaria, they are probably not 100% Jewish. Samaria, we already know, it's mixed Jew and mixed Gentile. Uh, Phoenicia, Lebanon, probably is more of a Gentile church. And so for them, when they hear, oh, this is what God has done, there's great, great joy. Oh, God has done such a wonderful thing. And then they arrive in Jerusalem, and we have another good response. They're welcomed by the church, the apostles, the elders, and they tell them, this is what God has been doing. So here we see this great, this great response, but then... I don't know. I've got slides all over the place, don't, don't I? Okay, so they're sent on their way by the church. Uh, this brings great joy to all believers. So in Jerusalem, then they have another welcome. But before they even have a chance to finish, look with me at verse 5. Same thing that happened in Antioch. And we read, Some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and commanded to obey the law of Moses. Now remember... It's the Pharisee party. But they're Christians also. This is the party that Paul used to be part of, right? A zealous, zealous Jew who kept the law. And they say, they've got to, be, they've got to follow the law of Moses. So again, we come back to, isn't this a Jewish argument? And some of us are sitting here this morning and saying, I, this is a note. Why are we even talking about this? Why are we looking at this this morning? Here is why. What they're saying is, if you're going to be a Christian, you've got to be Jewish first. And this morning we would say, well, that doesn't make sense to me. You know, we're not, we're not going to be Jewish. What does this really mean? What this really means is this. Here's the heart of the argument, and this is why it's significant for us this morning. These people were saying, in addition to believing in Jesus for salvation... You must also do this. Ah, now it's different when we think of it that way, isn't it? How many of you, think about it, how many of you in your religious life, before you were a Christian or maybe even after becoming a Christian, you have felt 
heard, been taught, or practiced, yes, I believe that Jesus is the way to Je is the way to salvation. Yes, I believe that Jesus died for me for my sins, and so I'm a Christian. But I also need to do this. I must do this. If I don't do this, it's not enough. My grandmother, and you've heard me talk about her before, my grandmother was old order Amish. And she was religious. She was sincere. She lived a good, good life. And she believed that Jesus was the way to salvation. But she was also taught and practiced if I don't wear a covering on my head all the time, as the Amish do, then I'm not righteous. She was taught and believed, you do the best you can. You be good. Yes, read the Bible, but you be good. And at the end, when you die, if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you will be accepted into heaven. Now, some of you know what I'm talking about. Your, your background is not Amish, but you have believed that or you've been taught that as well, right? If, I'm, if there's more good than there is bad, then I'll be okay with God. And she would, but she was also told, but there's no way to know until you get there. So you just hope for the best and do the best that you can. What bondage what fear. Now some of you this morning, as we look at this, are saying, well, Pastor Jennifer, I understand that's a no-brainer. I don't believe like your grandmother. I know that Jesus is the way to salvation. But I want to challenge you this morning, as I was praying for us yesterday, and I was praying about this message, and this is the question that the Holy Spirit gave me for us. Two questions. Ask yourself honestly this morning, what are you depending on for your salvation this morning? That's the easy question. Most of you would say, yes, I depend on Jesus. Here's the second question. What do you feel makes you more acceptable to God? What are the things in your life what are the things that you're doing? If I do this, I am more acceptable to God. If I don't do this, God will love me more. If I do this, then I am righteous. And what I want to say to you this morning is, if you can't answer those questions clearly, if you can't say, Jesus is my righteousness, Jesus makes me acceptable to God, and that's the only way, that's the only thing on which I depend, if we cannot say that clearly and directly this morning, then this message is for us. This message is for us. So many of us depend on other things. And I'm not talking about, is, should there be righteous living when we're Christians? Absolutely there should be righteous living. But I want to tell you something. Righteous living does not make us righteous. Righteous living does not make us righteous. Jesus makes us righteous. Jesus is the only one. Jesus is the only price acceptable to God that makes us okay with Him. And the, the big argument that they had, honestly, brothers and sisters, I think it's something that a lot of Christians today still have to think about and still have to deal with. I, talk, I think there are Christians in Lighthouse that are struggling with this. Well, I'm trying to do the best I can. Well, I'm trying to be good. Well, I'm trying to, yes, I know Jesus has forgiven my sins, but I've got to do this also. And what I want to say to you is this. In your life, it is Jesus plus nothing. Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. And if there's anything else in your life that you're depending on this morning, then you're living in bondage and you're living in fear. Because then it's self-effort, isn't it? We are saved through Jesus. 
we're not safe through anything we can do. And that was the argument. That's the thing that was going on. And so they stood up and they said, they've got to be circumcised. They've got to obey. They've got to be. Look how strong this is. They've got to be commanded to obey the law of Moses. Wow, those are strong words, aren't they? Commanded. You must. You must. And so they meet to settle this. Then the apostles and the elders met together to consider this question. It's a serious question. And you know what to me is interesting? You and I look back and we think, well, why did they even have to discuss it? Do you think that? Of course Jesus is the only way to salvation. But remember, the New Testament had not yet been written. They had the oral teachings of Jesus that they had passed down, but there was nothing, there was no scripture yet. They were living the book of Acts. They had the Old Testament, which was the law, and Jesus said, I'm the fulfillment of the law. But what they had was their experience, and what they had was the leading of the Holy Spirit, and the experiences that they had as Christians as they were going through. So they come to us, they're going to have to make a decision about this. It's a serious decision. And brothers and sisters, the discussion that they had has influenced what you and I are today as Christians. The discussion and the argument they had and how they settled it makes a difference in your life and my life today. And so they meet to discuss. Uh, the Bible is so diplomatic. It says they met together to consider this question. May I tell you what it really means? It was a war. That's what it means. It was a Christian war, but it was a war, okay? Um, they handled it in the right way, but it was a huge, it was a huge discussion. Do you ever think sometimes services go very, very long? Let me tell you something. According to what is written in the Bible, this meeting, this long discussion, it actually took several days. Not several hours. Several days. The apostles, Paul and Barnabas arrive, they tell them what happens, and then there's another meeting and people say, no, they've got to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. And then the leaders meet together, the apostles and the elders met together, and then they begin to discuss, and you know what it is? Here's the setup. So the apostles and the elders, they are discussing as leaders, but there's the whole group of the church, and the whole group of the church is listening and also wah, 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 at the same time as the leaders and the elders are discussing. That's that would have been the setup, okay? That would have been the format. So look at, with me at this. At the meeting, and you can look at your notes as well, because this gives us some ideas about how, uh, how the leaders work to solve the conflict. Hey, do you ever have conflict? Yes. Thank you. Do you ever have conflict in the church? Yes. Usually, right? <laughs> Usually. Honestly, brothers and sisters, that's why this is such a great chapter for us. That's why we don't want to bounce over it. There's big conflict and then there's personal conflict, all of which we encounter in the church. And so what we see here, and as you'll see in the notes that, I ha that I've, I've given you, I've given us some questions to consider. How do they handle this conflict? Look at it. After a long discussion, long discussion means several days. You know what that means? They gave a chance for everybody to be heard. How many of you have ever been in a discussion? Let's put it the nice, the nice word, right? You've been in a discussion and the other side won't let you share what you think and what you feel. They cut you off and they keep on talking. Don't you hate it? Isn't it frustrating? You want to say something too, right? Here's the great thing about what we see here. What seems very obvious is all sides are heard, okay? Everybody has a chance to share. Everybody says, well, I think the scripture says this. Well, I think the scripture says that. That's important. If we're going to settle conflict, everybody has to be heard. Every opinion, everybody has to say, well, I feel this way. I feel that way. If not, there will be those who, are cut off, who will be cut off, and then the conflict will not be solved. Now, you may come to an answer and say, well, this is what we're going to do, and that's fine, but if if you can't come to if you can't come to an agreement of some sort where at least others are heard then those that have said you didn't listen to me you didn't listen to what was important to me they will continue to feel that in their hearts and the problem will still be there and so there's a long discussion and then Peter stood up 
I love this. You all know that Peter's one of my favorite characters, but here's one of the things I really love. And this, as I have said before, I always see signs of hope for myself in Peter. And so should you if you struggle with certain things. Because remember, in the past, who was always the first to speak? Always. Who? Peter. Peter was always the first to speak. Now you say, but he's the first to speak here too. He's the first to stand up, but look what it says. After a long discussion, everybody's been speaking, and so Peter has been waiting, and then he addressed them. Now you say, oh, don't get, I don't want to get bogged down in all of this. I agree with you. Let's not get bogged down. I got bogged down yesterday in preparation, and finally I thought, i got to get out of it for a while, and I went out, and I walked up the mountain, and I was praying. It's like, Lord, I don't want to get bogged down in this, and I don't want to bog down the church in this. Give me some clarity and give me some direction, and, and here's how to look at it. Peter stands up and he speaks about his experience. And so he speaks about the past. Does that make sense? He speaks about what has happened in the past and he gives the example of Cornelius and going to the house of Cornelius. Can anybody argue against that? No. Nobody can argue because everybody had agreed this was God. God, Peter says, God gave them gave us the Holy Spirit the same way he gave them. Wow, that's kind of great. He puts the Gentiles before the Jews in this big discussion. And he says, God looked at the outside, God looked at the inside. He looked at their hearts and he saw their heart has changed. Have you ever looked at someone who is coming towards God and all you can see is the outside part and the outside part looks like such a mess? You know what I mean? And they look like they're so far from God, right? They look like they're so far from God. I am so grateful that God doesn't look at the outside part. God looks at the heart. Listen, God looked at your heart when you were a mess on the outside, but he saw there was something in your heart that was real, that was true, that wanted him. Let us be slower, brothers and sisters, to judge externals. Let us be slower to judge externals. God looks at the heart. And when the heart changes, God can take care of all these outside things, can't he? But give him time. Sometimes the outside parts, it takes a little while, right? It takes a little while. It, I, I, you know, I come from the countryside in the US and there's a lake in front of the house and so my dad used to use analogies at times about fishing and whatever and and and, and I thought this is particularly good if, 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 if you're thinking about something like this because Peter says God knows people's hearts he knows people's hearts and he saw these Gentiles they weren't circumcised and they weren't keeping the law of Moses and they were eating in pagan temples and there were some of them indulging in sexual immorality for sure for sure they were Gentiles but then God saw their hearts and they opened their hearts to the word and dad talks about it this way in the past dad used to talk about it this way you know my dad loves he used to love to fish he'd go fishing in the morning early and then he uh, and then sometimes he'd let him go again sometimes he'd keep them he's he was a super fisherman um, but he was talking about salvation and Christianity being a lot like this. A lot of times you and I try to clean the fish before we catch before they're caught. Do you know what I mean? We try to get the scales off and gut them and get the stomach and the lungs and all these things out. And if you think about it, and some of you are saying, what? Let me put it this way. Let Jesus catch the fish. After the fish is caught, then the cleaning process takes place. But until a person is a child of God, forget about cleaning. That's all external. Forget about trying to make it nice and this and that. Jesus is the one who cleans us up after he catches us, after we respond to him. And Peter says, God looked at their hearts. Aren't you glad that God looked at your heart? Amen. Amen. And may we look at God and let God judge people. And so Peter gives them the reminder of the past. And he says, look, he says, he cleansed their hearts through faith 
And then I love this. Look what Peter says. And I thought, ouch, I was thinking about this. He says, you want them to keep the law. May I paraphrase? He says, you want them to keep the law and you can't even keep the law. He's talking to Jews. May I ask you something this morning? Please don't say, say yes, pastor, that, that is I. How many of us have ever demanded better behavior of others than we have of ourselves? <laughs> We're all laughing because we've all done it. We want people to, you got to do this when we ourselves are not doing it. And that's basically what Peter says. He says, you want them to keep the law? You can't even keep the law. Why? The law is self-effort. And so Peter stands up and he says, we are, here's our key verse. We're saved the same way by the grace of the Lord Jesus. Amen. That's how we're saved this morning. So that's the past. And then, here's the present. Then the whole assembly fell silent. Do you know why they fell silent? Oh, that's right. That's right. So here's the whole assembly. Here are all the people that are arguing out there. And then, Barnabas and Paul begin to describe all the signs and wonders. This is the present. This is what God has just done, right? So Peter is the past. What's the present? Here's what God is doing now among the Gentiles. Can they argue against this? Nope. They all agreed this was the grace of God. God was doing a wonderful thing among the Gentiles. So Barnabas and Paul, they share. And then what happens? When they had finished, James stood. Here we go. James, the half-brother of Jesus, he stands up. He sort of has the final word. He's the leader at this point. He's the leader of the church. And he, st he said, brothers, listen to me. And he says, Simeon. Who is Simeon? Simon. Si who's Simon? You're, you all are scared. It's not a trick question. <laughs> you know who he is. It's Simon Peter, right? Why does James say Simeon? Simeon is the Hebrew pronunciation of the Hebrew name Simon. Peter is the Greek Roman name. But he's speaking to a bunch of Jews and it's a discussion about Jewish things. So what does James do? So wise, he says Simeon to remind them, to remind them. This is one of our own. And this is what he said. Okay, here's what Simeon said. And then, what does James do? James doesn't have the same experience they have, but what does James do? He goes to what? Scripture! He goes to the Old Testament. He goes to the Bible and he says, Look, God said this and it's recorded in the Word and the Word agrees with what is happening. Is there any way they can argue against the Word of God? Not and be sincere about it. There's no way. If you ha and I have questions about what we should do, what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is bad, what is okay, what is not so okay, and you can't figure it out, go to the Word of God. People have experiences. That can be part of it. But you go to the Word of God. Bring everything. Because now the Word of God is complete. We have 66 books. 39 in the Old Testament. 27 in the New Testament. It's all there, brothers and sisters. And we have the Holy Spirit who can help us and guide us. And James goes to the Scripture and he says, Look, God Himself said that He will restore the fallen house of David. What's the fallen house of David? Who is the offspring of David? Who? Who, Louisa? Jesus was the, was the offspring of David. Jesus was the offspring of David. And Jesus comes, and through Jesus, the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles, including you, and including me, including every terrible person that you and I think is our enemy and is so far from God. Jesus is the way for each one of them. And so, amen. Amen. This is not just about Jews and Gentiles way back when. It's about you and me today and how God loves and has made a way for everyone, for everyone, for everyone. And he says he made these things known long ago. God has spoken. And when God speaks, that's the final word, isn't it? James points to the future. So Peter's the past, Barnabas and Paul the present. 
and James is the future because then he says, this is what we should do. And so my judgment is we shouldn't cause trouble for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Hey, brothers and sisters, don't cause trouble for those sinners who are turning to God. <laughs> be gentle, be kind, be loving. Let God work in people's hearts. I mean it. I mean it. Let's let God work, work in people's hearts. He'll, he's caught the fish. He'll clean them. He'll clean them. Give them some time. Give them some time. Because God won't offend them when he begins to clean them. You and I will offend them, won't we? That dress is too short. <laughs> you do what? Let God clean them. Let God clean them. Now God may use us at times as well, but let, let God clean them because we come to the word as well. And so this word trouble means to crowd in on. That's in your notes. So James points to the future and he says, instead, let's write a letter. Okay? And so as we come to a conclusion this morning, as we come to this, what are they going to do? They're going to send Paul and Barnabas back. But you know what? Paul and Barnabas are already on one side, right? Paul and Barnabas on the Gentile side already. And then he says, we're going to write a letter. He says, so we're going to send two of our own, Judas and Silas. Why? They're on the Jewish side of the things. And just so that there's no confusion, we're going to write a letter as well. And what is that letter going to say? Mm. Here we go. We've talked about conflict. Here's the answer. Do you know what the answer is? Compromise. The answer is compromise. You say, oh no, Pastor Jennifer, compromise is a bad thing. <laughs> Not always. You don't compromise on the essentials. But you know what, brothers and sisters? You can compromise on almost everything else. Did you know that? You can. The only thing we don't compromise on are the essentials. And they took care of that. Salvation is in Jesus only. Everything else is kind of extra. And so here's the compromise. You ready? Don't tell these Gentiles, don't eat food offered to idols. Well, now some of us this morning don't like that. We say, I want to eat food offered to idols. It's good food. <laughs> and Paul already said, idols aren't anything. So I want to eat food offered to idols. What's wrong with that? I want my freedom. I'm free. Jesus has made us free. How many of us say that? Mm. We do sometimes, don't we? Here's the point, brothers and sisters. The compromise they were willing to make was to bring unity and harmony. That's the point. Does that make sense? And that's why this, 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 whole, this whole thing that we've been talking about is helpful to us this morning. What they, were, what they were working towards was to bring harmony and unity in the church. Remember, it was a church of all sorts. It was a church of Jews, and it was a church of Gentiles, and they had very strong beliefs and ideas in, 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 a different, in, in different areas. May I give you a very specific example from years ago when I was in Singapore, uh, when I was growing up in Singapore, the church where mom and dad were teaching in Singapore. And it was a mixed church. It was primarily Chinese. Of course, this was in the 50s and 60s. It was primarily Chinese, but there were also some uh, converted Muslims, uh, and there were also uh, some converted Hindus who were part of the church as well. Well, the Hindus, the, the Indians, would come to the church and they'd dress up because it was church. And they, the women would wear their saris, S-A-R-I, the beautiful Indian dress. And the Chinese would be scandalized, the Chinese Christians. Why? because the saris, many times for the women, it was a little bit low in the front. And at that time, especially with Singapore also, and it was open around the middle, right? It was a sari, so there was all this open part. And, the Chi and they came to church that way. And the Chinese believers were scandalized and they just thought, that's just ungodly. That's just ungodly. How can they show that? And yet, the Chinese believers, the women, we're talking about the women, when they dressed up, they would wear a cheong sam or a qi pao. And it would be covered here, and it would be covered here, but here, <laughs> right, Janice? Right, right, Flora? It'd go all, right? It'd go all the way up to here. 
And the Indian Christians were scandalized. <laughs> How can you show your legs like that? <laughs> we bring things to church and to Christianity that are important to us but not very important to God. And our goal is harmony, unity, and love expressed. And so if we're going to have harmony and unity, everybody's going to have to give something. Everybody's going to have to give in something. Everybody's going to have to give up something. And some of us may have to give up some freedom because we don't want to offend our brothers and sisters. And some of us may have to give up some things that we feel strongly about. Well, they shouldn't do that. Let God take care of it. And so when James writes this, and we're, give me about two more minutes and we close. Don't eat food offered to idols. Was he being legalistic? That sounds like rules again. No. Gentiles and Jews had fellowship together at the table. And this food offered to idols would have been so offensive to Jews that it would have broken fellowship. What else? Sexual immorality. You say, well, of course, Pastor Jennifer. But for Antioch especially, notoriously immoral. Notoriously immoral. And most Greek and Roman culture, sexual immorality was accepted and practiced. And so that was a weakness. And so they needed to know about that. What else? From eating the meat of strangled animals and from consuming blood. Why? For the Jews that was so important that it would have broken fellowship because it was so much apart. And so they said, so James said, stop doing those things. Give up those things. And you say, well, well what about the Jews? What did they give up? And the Jews gave up the insistence, you've got to keep the law of Moses. This is how God first spoke to us. It was the law of Moses. Hey, they have to be circumcised. They have to whatever. No, they don't. And both sides gave in, and both sides gave up. Did they accept it? Yes, they did. And we're going to stop here. But I challenge you this morning as we come to a close. Our goal, we keep the essentials, but our goal also, beyond the essentials, is harmony, harmony, unity, and love. What are we willing to let go of? What freedoms that we claim so strongly, and we all do, we all do, are we willing to say, you know what? Harmony with my brother and my sister is more important than saying, I have a right to this. Because both sides gave up something, the church was preserved. It didn't split. Do you know what would have happened if both sides had disagreed? Because the Antioch church joyfully accepted it. And we'll finish that up next week. They said yes, and they rejoiced. They rejoiced over it. We can do that. And the Jewish church accepted it. And because of that, the church today is different. And because of that, you and I are here today. So, my question to you, and to me, because I'm part of it, am I willing to let go of some things and give up some things so that I don't offend you? So that I keep unity and harmony? And the second question is, I, I really mean that. I, I really mean that. Am I willing to give up something? I am. I am. I don't want to offend you. And then the second question is, the one we said earlier, am I depending on anything other than Jesus to make me acceptable to God? If I am, I'm like those Jewish teachers that said, you've got to do this. And God has given us Jesus. Let me close in prayer this morning. Let me pray for you. Consider those two questions this morning. This was a real practical question message this morning, but it's for us. Ask yourself these two questions and then respond to the Holy Spirit this morning. Lord, we come to you this morning and God, we thank you 
that rather than glossing over the big argument in the church, you included it in your word. That confirms and that reassures us that you deal with us as real people, that they weren't holy saints floating two feet off the ground, but they were people just as we are people. And they dealt with things, Lord, and we want to deal with those things in the same way. God, I pray this morning that we as a church, and we as individuals, Lord, that we would be willing to give up and give in and let go of some things that are not essential, that we might promote and encourage harmony and unity with our brothers and our sisters for whom you died. And then, Lord, I pray this morning that as we come to you, we would cast aside anything else, our good works, our offerings, our, our, our trying to do good deeds or this or anything else that we're depending on to make us right with you and that we're going to cling only to Jesus and let him be our righteousness and be accepted by you because of Jesus. Thank you for your work in our lives. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for setting us free from bondage and law and all the long list of we got to do this for you to be happy with us. You're happy with us because of Jesus. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you, brother.